patents, and so that's why we've applied for a patent. Our system eliminates inventory and unnecessary shipping. It also shortens the operating cycle from 18 months to two weeks from design to delivery. So the technology, the steps in the technology is uh, use augmented reality to browse, select, uh, and resize, customize the product before purchasing. And we are translating that purchase into the code that drives robotics, CNC machines, and bills of materials. And then we're sending it to an idle facility in your hometown or your home region less than an hour away so that we can really take care of customers really well. So we're starting with furniture because the furniture industry is an $18 billion industry that spends $9 billion on the management and distribution of inventory. We're eliminating $9 billion of logistics out of the industry if we had the whole thing. So, and at the same time, we're solving a problem that 56% of uh, shoppers confront when they shop for furniture. They find what they love, but they can't get in the size, color, material they need. And so we are solving that. We've made it as easy as buying from Amazon. Choose your product, customize it. We deliver it in a couple of weeks. Super easy, super transparent. Because ultimately these manufacturers, the custom cabinet shops and the millwork shops that we're using the machines of are located in every metro area in North America and the Northern Hemisphere actually. And so uh, we're tapping into that idle time to create a zero footprint, capital efficient distributed manufacturing environment. It's like Airbnb, but for idle robots. We can be uh, less than an hour away from 135 million households. That's two thirds of the population. At the same time, we're not shipping trees from Appalachia to China to Malaysia and back as container loads of furniture. But we're supporting our local businesses. We're creating hometown jobs. We're eliminating tons of bad inventory landfilling. And we're, for every product we sell, we spend $3 to plant three trees to replace more than the wood we use and to completely offset the carbon emitted during the electricity generation and local fuel from delivery. So this is, this is what makes us radically different. We are eliminating 50% of everyone, the industry's cost stack. And so we can allocate to higher quality materials, hometown manufacturing, higher gross margins for growth, and higher net profits and EBITDA for investors. And at the same time, we're, we're focused and we can focus on the things that really matter to the consumer. You know, like size customization, high grade materials, fast delivery, quasi unlimited styles. And no one else in the industry can, can focus on all of these factors all of these elements because they're too cash constrained. So our go to market is essentially, um, we can serve multiple buyer classes, but in the consumer class, we have two uh, basic uh, uh, demographics, adults under 40, they want online, easy, fast and customized. And then we have the folks who've looked and looked and looked and they can't find what is the best solution for them. And we can address both of these categories directly because ultimately we're producing custom made goods every time for every, every buyer. And so at this crate and barrel price point, we, um, which we're selling at currently, we can be, we are delivering a much higher quality product. So we are also anticipating that we're going to grow the market size by three to four billion by, you know, from the existing $18 billion. We started selling in uh, June when Google put us on their employee perks website. And since then we were invited to Microsoft and Apple's um, employee perks website um, programs also. And so we've been selling to Microsoft um, to 
you know, and we're in 14 regions around the country. And we're also in conversations with commercial office channel partners because they will be a source of repeat sales and we can increase their sales conversions. Because uh, not at the steel case tier, but at the lower tier, those, those corporate customers for these dealers, they, they behave like consumers. And so uh, that's what we're, that's how we're go to market. And in terms of Passport Corporate, we're focused on the Bay Area uh, and targeting the 170,000 folks um, in that program, you know, Genentech, Apple, Oracle workers, well-paid folks who are currently work, still working from home. And so we've been selling a lot of home office desks and we're strengthening our brand with uh, Andre Basegi. He's a co-founder and he, he started his career with Kate and Andy Spade before they moved it from the brand from New Mexico to New York. And he became a partner at Gold before uh, starting his own shop. We can sell a billion dollars of product without any manufacturing or inventory investment. And uh, we grew at a monthly growth rate in the fourth quarter of 40% with no working capital impositions. It's all, it's all marginal cost, all marginal activity. And so the, our goal to grow is to be within the top 60 metro areas within one hour of two thirds of the US population, allowing everyone from those regions to buy from custom as easily as they would buy from Amazon. I've got a rock star team to support this. Uh, Kevin, he's been a software engineer his entire life. He's managed uh, multi-million dollar global projects. Uh, he built our technology from AR to e-commerce. Melinda has been a CMO. Um, well, she, she's our CMO, but she's, she's, she started with Google AdWords before moving to WPP as a partner, advising Fortune 500 companies on their digital strategies. Uh, Leland's been in the industry 40 years. He was also last year's Cabinet Makers Association, or the 2019 Cabinet Makers Association president. Ashton's uh, leading our growth and communications, social media. My background is in operations and finance um, between the US and Europe. I, I've overseen hyper growth. I've overseen very large business units. I also invented the patent claim. So we are doing a raise, you know, every uh, 70%, 70 to 80% of what we raise will go into revenue growth because we've built our technology. It's already been invested. Version one is live. And yeah, so um, currently we're, you know, we're raising at 5.5 million uh, pre-money, but there's still a little bit of room on a $4 million cap safe. And yeah, uh, the, we do foresee there are, if my deck would react, Okay, we do foresee that uh, there are a lot of um, strategics and exits. And so this is just for the furniture industry, um, the, our first application of the technology. So it's an additive business on the top line, on the bottom line. It's a new, it's a new co consumer group for all of these traditional and online retailers. And so we are looking for uh, folks to join us on this journey to to grow our local economies and really restructure manufacturing processes in a very eco-friendly way. So I'm looking for um, referrals to corporates that might be able to benefit from this technology. I'm looking for um, corporates who would want to offer it to their employees as well as investors, of course. Thank you. Wow, thanks. That was a. Uh... That's an amazingly detailed and uh, exciting deck you got there and a phenomenal idea. I think we're gonna have some good questions for you. Um, just so people know, I think you're out of Ohio right now, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, currently exiled from New York and back in, in Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing wrong with Ohio. I mean, I grew up in Michigan, but I, so. <laughs> so did I, we're, we're in Michigan. I grew up in uh, just outside of Detroit in the Farmington area. 
Okay, I, I was just north of you in at uh, Long Lake and Telegraph. Oh, I know right where that is. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was at 13 Mile and Drake Road, <laughs> so just not too far. There you go, Michiganders. Woo <clears throat> All right, I'm looking here to see who we've got. And we've got a bunch of hands already raised. Um, I have to get rid of one thing on my screen so that I don't lose track. There we go. All right, so if we want, uh, we can get going with some stuff. The first hand I have up is, is Leif. That's me. <laughs> hi, everyone. Hi, Tino. Um, very great information you had there. I, I'm actually pretty intrigued to ask you a question about this because I'm looking for furniture right now. My last career was in furniture manufacturing, so I feel very ready for this um, conversation. So of my 10 questions I wrote down, I think I'm going to jump into one is, um, how are you going to kind of like avoid the problem of the paradox of choice if you have all these different options and all these different potential things? If you said we have a limited quasi unlimited options here because we can custom make it, how are you going to help people, customers convert into a sale when they're just faced with so many potential options. Yeah. yeah, think of it like uh, buying shoes. You identify the, the style and, and form you want, and then you can buy the size and colors you need. So you're saying the choices are mostly like not aesthetically, but more so the size of it? Well, there's, there's uh, as, uh, among styles, you can choose the aesthetics. So uh, we have, um, we're going to eventually have hundreds and thousands of models. And then, the, and then the customization, we'll have two levels of customization. For the typical consumer, they will be able to scale it in size and choose the material among half a dozen materials to eliminate that paradox of choice. Mm. But for those who are in the trade or have a login, they will be able to choose among the infinite variety of materials right. and, and configurations. I see. So you're like working, you're talking about people uh, to the trade people, designers that want to make bespoke pieces for their clients. Okay. Got it. Um, and then my next question, I'm just going to sneak another one in here is you talked about like CNC and uh, idle machine time. Is this a lot of this furniture being made with CNC? Cause I looked at the stuff that you're currently offering. It doesn't seem like it, it this seems like it's all square cut pieces. Uh, what's, what's the story there? Yeah, there are, it is all CNC cut and, um, and that's that's how we drive the efficiency. That's how we drive the accuracy. Can you and translate it for us? What does that mean? Uh, CNC, they are robots. They are robots. Um, if you're familiar with three D printing, uh, you know the the robot is told what to do. In in this case, where to cut the wood that is fed into the machine. And so the uh, so we 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 produce the code that drives the machines and we supply the materials. So we control eighty five percent of the quality control aspect at the same time. And then the only the only workshops that have these uh, machines are the more established local workshops that live and die by their reputations. And that controls the rest of the quality control. It's it's been working awesome, you know. It's a it's a delegation model similar to Airbnb, where the top hosts, in our case, are the ones with the machines. And yeah, it's 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 um, it's working really well. That's great to hear. Thanks for answering my questions. Great. Yeah. So Katie, uh, it stands for computer numerical control. I was looking it up as you asked the question. So perfect. Uh, the next question is from Hillary Fosdale. Hello. Um, yeah, that was a really great presentation. Um, I, for one, love the fact that you introduced your team. That for me was actually a really strong point that you were like, hey, it's me and all these people that are incredibly talented. That was like a stark shift. Um, I think um, for me, my first thought was, wow, there are a lot of numbers. And when we got to who you were and what your background was, I understood more why there were so many numbers. I was like, oh, it's a numbers guy. Like, this is where he's comfortable. And I was like, okay, that makes sense. Um, one thing, um, I am a little bit familiar with logistics. And so when you were talking about 
people making uh, able to order custom things. As a consumer, I was curious to see what that process looked like. So it would have been great to see what that was just to walk through. I think the image that you had of the man and the woman with the oversized um, piece of uh, furniture that they got was getting close to that. But I really wanted to sort of see a, like a quick 15 second step through of like screenshots of like what that process of ordering was like. Um, but back to the logistics side, I'm curious when someone orders something, returns are a really big deal. So how are you handling returns? Yeah, we, we send someone to pick it up and we, in, in New York, we have a deal with Habitat for, for Humanity. And so we're doing a co-promotion uh, for not, the, not their clients, but their patrons uh, to be able to buy from us because of the demographic difference. And, but when we get a return, we just pick it up and they, and drop it off at a restore, they resell it. In, in other regions, we pick it up and it, if we can recover, if, if for example, if it's a, um, Generally, we take it to a consignment shop and just be done with it. And but if in a case like a um, adjustable height desk where the huge part of the value is in the legs, I'll put it out for rent. Okay, thank you. That's fantastic. That was a really great question, and I hadn't even thought about that. So I it's so awesome to have so many minds here that that know to ask these questions. The next person is Katie. Oh my gosh. Uh, well, just like I'm completely like wowed and floored by this whole concept. Uh, you know, I've, I've been through multiple purchases myself um, of furniture with other people in my demographic. Like I think just from a general mm -hmm. feedback perspective, like I really I would completely agree with you that like this is the right dem like the millennial demographic is a really good demographic to follow um, and and to be marketing towards and you know to that end I'm just really curious of like how are people going to find you right like I think you know I, I recently went through the process where we were wanting to buy a new coffee table and um you know we wanted I, we had finally seen one of those lift top ones over at west elm and we almost pulled the trigger on that but it really didn't meet our criteria and then we ended up kind of defaulting to wayfair and amazon for their selection and so like how are people gonna default to you instead of what i did yeah the uh... Right now we're doing these associations with established corporates. Uh, so that way we get this, you know, we get this, um, we become more visible more easily and we get, we capture a halo effect. You know, a bunch of our customers uh, have literally told me that, hey, uh, Google, my employer Google recommended you. <laughs> it's like, exactly. <laughs> And so, um, but generally it's uh, a lot of social media marketing and we're getting yield on uh, our SEM strategy, um, social media marketing, uh, Google marketing, search engine marketing. And um, yeah, so it's, um, and then we're, we have a lot of, um, because, it, because we're not ordering container loads of furniture, we can address niche demands very rapidly. And so right now we're, we're focused on Washington DC with a bunch of, uh, we're going to be um, launching more custom desks because Washington DC for the next three months is going to be a hot real estate transaction zone. And so, totally. so it's, it's, it's our differentiator is uh, we can, we can look for these latent opportunities that would take a traditional retailer much more effort to to uh, take advantage of. Yeah, that's incredible. Well, congrats and thank you. Thanks. Well, okay, great. Uh, the next person who's up is, uh, and my list is Jay. Thank you. 
wonderful presentation, Tino. I really enjoyed it. Um, I love the I I, I, you know, I have somebody who has you know worked on my own house, had situations where like it, you know it just doesn't fit. So like yeah, I've had this problem, and like yes, it's a it's definitely uh, a need. Um, two things that well, Katie kind of asked my question already. So like thank you, Katie, for asking that. Like uh, you know how are you going to reach those customers? Um, and, you know, in my role as a librarian, you know, look, look, I'm also a data guy and looking for uh, data. And, you know, I, as you were talking, I was looking up, you know, some of those areas that you mentioned um, and found that, uh, yeah, San Francisco is, you know, uh, the average consumer in San Francisco spends $696 on furniture, whereas in New York, Five hundred and forty-eight dollars. Um, so it's a big difference in some of these metro areas. And then I just added uh, Washington D.C. metro area, five hundred and eighty-two dollars. Uh, but Seattle is right up there with San Francisco in terms of uh, furniture sales. So um, just kind of like thinking about uh, those those pieces. Um, but it sounds like you've got like a a lot of good um, data and strategy there too. Um, I guess my other question was similar to what Leif was was asking, you know, about uh, about as a consumer, like choice and and where, uh, you know, I even though I do a lot of work myself, I don't actually trust my own uh, design eye. <laughs> so, like, I guess you know, getting that, you know, in getting that part of the cons uh, of the professional help, you know, to that consumer, I guess, is one my my uh questions there yeah the you know we are really um i'm seeing already that cu uh customer service and that consumer that buyer support is going to be a big portion of it because you know it's uh, i was corresponding um with a google engineer in in santa monica in los angeles uh, and because he's an engineer, he wanted lots of questions answered, and and so uh, and I've and even even other customers that we've um, dealt with, they really appreciate this customer support aspect, and so that's going to be um, a for 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 to 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 provide more comfort, to provide more confidence, and uh, to differentiate us from you know, Amazon and Wayfair and the like. Because, uh, you know, even with our economics, uh, we still do need to charge, um, you know, at a higher price tier than, than Value City. Right, yeah. Okay, uh, thanks for that. That's a great question as well. Um, Shreyas, you're up. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Yeah, you did. And uh, I'm new to the group. So hello, everyone. Um, Welcome aboard. Thank you. Uh, so Tina, thank you for, for that great talk. Uh, it's uh, cool learning about uh, what you're doing. And distributed manufacturing is definitely one of those hot words coming on nowadays. So it's cool to see that. Um, my background is actually in engineering and uh, manufacturing. And so I'm, I'm kind of curious about all your partners and how you ensure quality with them. Um, I, I, uh, I personally working with my supply chain, it's, it can be a nightmare to make sure that everyone's actually producing to the drawings and um, the first units can turn out great. And then unit 20 is garbage. And so it's with, how do you manage to keep auditing all of those, those partners? Yeah. And so our manufacturing partners are the, um, are the best in a region. They generally are family, family owned, owner operator run, and they generally have between five and twenty employees. So they're they're minuscule companies, and you know the tone from the top is very. I mean, they're family companies, so they're very conscious of their reputation in the region, and so we choose them that way. We choose them by the fact that they have 200,000 or more in, in CapEx that they're amortizing over a very small business. And so they're, that automatically qualifies them as being the best in a region. So their culture 
is and their habits are part of our quality control mechanism. And then the fact that we produce the machine code, the machines don't, they don't make mistakes. You know, their, their error rate is like one thousandth or three thousandth of an inch. And we and then we provide the materials that, you know, so there's no mistake in what materials are bought and what materials are specified. There's no shortcuts. And so all of those things combine to a 95% consistency and very little discretion to go outside of our specs. Cool. And I guess um, tied back to Jay's like statistics um, that he threw out, um, I guess, why is your focus right now on expanding the partnerships instead of targeting the areas where there's a high willingness to pay, like the Bay Area, um, Seattle, like Washington, DC, like you said, um, I guess, do, do you think you have customers in like Alabama and Wyoming that are willing to spend $2,000 on premium furniture? Yeah, because, uh... You know, we're in 14 regions. So those regions are Seattle, the Bay Area. We have eight workshops in the Bay Area. So that's $30 million in annual capacity, just using three hours of machine time per day. But uh, we've got one in Glen, uh, Los Angeles, one in Albuquerque. And what we've been doing is when we get a sale, the first thing I do is notify the customer, if, hey, you're in a new region. Uh, we, you know, we're likely not going to be able to make our two week window. Are you okay with that? If they're okay with that, then we set up a manufacturing partnership. It's super easy. And it takes days to, to do that. We identify them, it takes a conversation. We're paying going rates. We're not asking for a discount. And so it's, it's super easy for them to say, yeah, I'll take the business. <laughs> and, and, then, and then the deal with them is once we're happy with each other's relationship, they will continue to serve that entire one, you know, one hour radius. And so from Glendale, they can serve 8 million people or 5 million people quite easily. And so that's, that's how that's how that relationship works. And it's, it's really easy. Cool. And I, I guess one, one other question is, um, I guess furniture manufacturing moved offshore for, I guess, some reason, right? Probably cost. And so I guess how, how have the economics changed where we're bringing it back now is makes sense. Cause I guess it started out being hyper-localized, like what you're moving back to. So what's different now that makes it work? Yeah, so um, hard, hard furniture, um, case goods furniture, non-upholstered furniture moved off, offshore in the early 2000s when China entered the WTO yes. and started uh, importing low cost furniture. And then when um, China was, um, had a, a tariff supply to it, it, it spread throughout um, um, Eastern Asia, you know, Malaysia, Indonesia, Etc. And that that uh, competitive price pressure caused all of the domestic manufacturers to offshore. And now they're all off. You know, now they're importing eighty-five to ninety percent of the furniture that is sold in the U.S. And that handcuffs them to this supply chain, and they can't move from that. And because of that uh, supply chain infrastructure that long distance global supply chain, it causes high standardization and it also causes a high cost stack for logistics and inventory management. So we've eliminated inventory, we've eliminated long distance logistics and that, that allows us to do certain pieces using a lot of automation locally. But the opportunity is the cost efficiency and economies of scale opportunity are huge because the machines are being charged Thomas. at around $180 an hour. The true cost of that machine is less than $10 an hour if it were run 24 hours a day. 
And so we've got this huge gap. By using the machines more, we'll be able to get, yeah, well, it's it's a you know it's an it's it's a simple line, right? <laughs> so we've got we've we've actually kind of run over, but we've got a couple of people who've had their hand up for a long time. Well, I want to get their their questions in. So if we could be very quick with these two, I'm sorry for these last two people, but uh, Tessa, you're up next. Hi, Tino. Um, thank you for sharing. I am not a money person. I'm a where the hell is the money person. Um, where is it going? And so my background is development. And so I'm extremely interested in like your, your focus on like what you're minimizing, how you're changing economics to work better for localizing places. And there's like lots of nuances to that argument. I guess my interest also stems to sustainability and your, I'm fascinated. You, it was touched on, you mentioned that you would just, if someone didn't like it or wanted to give it back or return it or whatever, you would just take it to consignment. I like that there's a lot of checks in here. High price point means there's not going to be like Ikea level buying or Wayfair level buying. And then also that if your your quality control is going to minimize how many people are just disliking what they got. But I'm thinking of the what is return and also the fact that you might be working, you're working with big partners like Google and things like that. If they shut down an entire office space or whatever, or like whatever happens like that, I'm wondering like, would you be... I'm just going to plant this seed now because I'm probably never going to talk to somebody who's at this level of their business ever like about this again. So would it be a interesting part and no, no business can do anything, but uh, everything, but like uh, taking on return, like offices that have shut down, taking their whatever you've given them and sold them and having a system where they can return it. So you are of like you were concerned with the final life cycle of this as much as possible and working with partners like you did Habitat with Humanity and maybe other partners like Salvation Army helping anything that like has already good at creating having space to supply these so that other people like new entrepreneurs who don't have money want to fill out an office with office nice office stuff they're less concerned about it fitting perfectly have you thought about that at all or considered what what might be like to see the full life cycle of your furniture so it doesn't go into landfill yeah, so right now, initially, uh, we're targeting uh, those folks that are not looking for disposable furniture because, you know, it's, uh, you know, folks under 40, their, their, their lives are settling down, their, their lives are stabilizing, they're settling down, they're buying real estate, they're forming families, so they want something that's not disposable, you know, anymore. But as we... Um, as we get uh, higher volumes and economies of scale on the manufacturing services side, we'll be able to address other uh, consumer groups. Like if if schools ever become what they are, you know, we, uh, the incoming student can scan their dorm room and with their iPhone twelves, and we'll capture that lidar image and pre-populate it with custom. Uh, low durability materials use furniture for the year or two that they're in, they need it and we'll recover it as part of the, and recycle it as part of the business model. Um, and we're not selling to the corporates themselves, we're selling to the employees, but as a point of clarification. Yes, I did not realize that. I'm sorry, I missed that bit. Okay, our last question is from Caleb. Hey, Tino, great presentation. I um, you piqued my interest when you entered. You know, started off with hey, it's AR and manufacturing. I've got a middle child that just um, started his his first job yesterday, Monday, whenever that was. AR in manufacturing, but a completely different application. It's on manufacturing lines and how to you know workflow management. And that's quality control. So I'm curious about your your AR, the patent side of it, because you've got a lot of stuff going on here. IoT, you've got to go to market, you've got a distribution, a supply chain management, logistics save cost down, but yeah, the, the patent aspect, just a, a short blurb on that to satisfy yeah. my curiosity. Yeah, the patent is, uh, uh, we've got two claims. Uh, one is we're giving the, con the buyer control of the, over the manufacturing process. And so the user interface is either AR, VR, XR, a computer device. And then the second claim, and that connects to a distributed manufacturing environment, 
because we're going uh, directly from that user interface into some sort of robotics, okay? And then the second claim is we're using XR, AR, VR, MR to, to uh, not as a data reporting tool from an existing catalog, but as a data generation tool to create new products that have never existed before. And so we're reversing the data flow, which is non-obvious. So pretty interesting. Thanks for sharing. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Hey, uh, so Tino, thank you so much. This has been fantastic, but we do end every, every week with um, a question. And I'd like to, uh, if I can grab the screen back, yeah, very quickly. And I will share my desktop. Voila. There we go. Can you guys see that? Yeah. Oh, great. All right. So our weekly question to you is what can we as a 1 million cups community do for you? Well, I'm looking for folks that are interested in what we're doing because um, there's enough here where um, a lot of collaborators, you know, I'm, I'm, I love, I mean, they're, we're trying to create a revolution, right? A revolution in manufacturing and a revolution in the economy, allowing the small businesses to compete with Amazons of the world. That, that, I need a lot of help and I want a lot of help and I want participation, you know, from, from anyone that wants to talk about this, you know, at whatever level where, of course, if you're um, a small investor, you can go to our WeFunder campaign. It's wefunder.com forward slash Baru Furniture. Or if you're a large investor, um, that would be cool too. Or if you know, if your neighbors are, you know, it's, I'm looking for exposure to the community, to folks who care about entrepreneurship, who care about our um, communities and, and what, we're, what we're doing. And it's, you know, it's no longer just an idea. You know, um, our last fourth quarter at, from a, a relatively small base still, but we were growing at an average monthly rate of 40%. And so it's, it's, it's real. Awesome. Well, that's fantastic. Thanks again for being here today. We're not done. We're not done. We still have more to talk about. And um, um, I don't know what just happened there. So I just want you to think, what can you do for the One Million Cups community? Well, first off, you can bring a friend next week. We'd love to have you. We have another great presentation for, ready to go. Uh, we also um, hope that you can um, meet us uh, and be part of this community as much as possible. But we're, we're looking for people to present. We're looking for more presenters. We've got January pretty much filled up, but we're, we're looking for more who want to present. So please, 1millioncups.com slash Seattle, we'll get you there and you can sign up. And, and, and even if you're not ready, we can help you get ready. So talk to us. And also we're still looking for uh, people to help us organize so that we can be more efficient as a team. So if you have anything that you wanna work on in your business skills and wanna have a pl safe place to practice those things, we'd love to have you join our team and practice them here. So. Oh, well, that, that's great. I think we've gone through everything. Whoop, there we go. We're going to go to some breakout rooms here. Hopefully you guys can stay on uh, as long as you can. Uh, you know, I think we'll give everyone about 10, 15 minutes at minimum. And